Hi, everyone. My name is Krista Page, and I am the director of the Low Income Tax Clinic here at Florida Rural Legal Services. Um, today, we're going to be talking about what to do if you can't pay your IRS debt. When you can't pay your IRS debt, you're going to be basically looking at three different categories. You're going to be looking at monthly payment plans, currently non-collectible status, and offers in compromise. Before we get into that information, I want to tell you a little bit about Frills and the Low Income Tax Clinic. So here at Florida Rural Legal Services, we provide free civil legal services to low income individuals, including families, vulnerable populations, the elderly, veterans and victims of crime throughout 14 counties in Florida, and that's been for over 57 years. The Low Income Tax Clinic, we, as, we are a team of tax attorneys and paralegals here at Florida Rural Legal Services who provide free representation and tax controversy for low income taxpayers as well as taxpayers who speak English as a second language. So now to get started with the information. If you owe the IRS any kind of balances, you would have received a tax notice. What you can see on the screen are two very common notices that the IRS will issue. The notice on, in the yellow is the CP14. What that is, is the initial notice when you owe a balance to the IRS, that is the notice they will send you. The notice on the right is the fourth collection notice that goes out, it's called the LT11. After that notice goes out, you have another generally about 30 to 52 days before the IRS can levy um, or issue any garnishments. Now, the reason I have these up is because I wanna kind of walk you through so you can understand these notices. The first thing I wanna point out is in the top corner, you can see the IRS official seal. That is very important because there are a lot of tax scams right now and they will not have that seal on them. So that's when you know it's a scam notice is if it does not have that IRS official seal on it. Now on the right hand upper corner, you'll see some information. What is in that information is the notice number. What that does is it can kind of tell you where in the process of collections that you are. It will also have the notice date, which is important because you want to see how you want the most recent notice because every month interest and penalties will continue to accrue on the balance that you owe. And so you want to make sure you have the most current information. You'll also see your either your social security number or your ITIN number. Um, you want to make sure that is correct. That is your number to make sure the notice is, is accurate and that is the balance that you owe. Now, if you go down a little bit, you're gonna see the amount of the balance that is due. You're also gonna see a tax year on there. So that's per year that may, it may or may not be the total amount that you owe to the IRS, but that is going to be assessed for the tax year that they label. You'll also see in the middle of the page, a breakdown of what that balance includes. Balances will include the principal amount of the balance that you owe, as well as additional penalties and interest. Like I said, those penalties and interest will continue to accrue monthly until your balance is either paid in full or it expires. Now at the bottom of the notices, you will usually have some kind of a payment voucher. That is if you can use that payment voucher to send in payments if you can afford to make them. The important thing I wanna point out is that when you send payments to the IRS, it does not mean that they will not take collection action towards you. So if you're just making voluntary payments using these payment vouchers, that does not protect you by itself from collection action with the IRS. You need to set up a formal agreement to make sure that you're protected from collection action. And so now that's what we're going to get into next. So the, there's basically three categories of alternative protective agreements. So when you can't pay your balance in full, the IRS offers these other agreements to you so that you can be protected. They will not issue collection action and these are formal, these will protect you. So the first category that we're looking at are monthly payment plans. 
um, they can either be set up by direct debit or manual payment. Now there's two types of payment plans generally. There are non-financial based, which are the streamlined or non-disclosure agreements. And then there are financial based payments where you have to disclose financial information to the IRS. Now to start with the streamlined agreements, there's going to be two general categories of those payment plans. If you owe a total amount to the IRS of under 50,000, you are going to be put into a 72 month payment plan if you can afford that. The way you find out the amount of your monthly payment is you just take the total amount of your balance plus your penalties and interest that have accrued up to date. You're going to divide that by 72 and whatever that equals is going to be your monthly payment to the IRS. The now for balances over 50,000, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to take the total am amount that you owe to the IRS, but this time you're going to divide it by 84 months and that will be either that will usually be automatically debited from your account for 84 months. Um, and like I said, that's the total. It's the principal amount plus all of the interest and penalties. Now, if you can't afford that, the IRS also offers what are called financial based payment agreements or partial pay agreements. Sometimes they're full pay, sometimes they're partial pay. We'll talk more about the partial pay. So when you submit, when you're looking at a partial pay and you submit that, the IRS does require that you submit your financial information to them. So you will, we will be looking in a minute, you'll be filling out a form to disclose all of your information. And then sometimes the IRS will require that you submit bank statements, income statements, proof of expenses, um, and anything else that you need to include on there. Um, the way that you would determine the amount of your monthly payment in that case is you would take your total household income minus your total household expenses. And this is on a monthly basis. Whatever that equals is going to be your monthly payment to the IRS. Now, with that being said, it's important to note that these are, when you're counting your expenses, these are necessary living expenses. So the IRS is not going to con be considering additional assets um, like secondary houses, secondary vehicles, um, if you own a boat or something like that, those are not going to be included in necessary living expenses. The IRS is looking at what you actually need to survive and then whatever you have left over after at the end of the month after you've paid all of those expenses, that is the uh, monthly payment that the IRS would expect for you to pay to them. So talking a little bit more about the streamlined or the non-disclosure agreement, that is the 72 month or the 84 month agreement. So like I said, this one is non-disclosure. You do not have to submit any financial information to the IRS. This is very much um, pretty much an automatic type thing, a qualification. You, if you owe it, all you have to do is fill out this form and you have to request it. But that is something you do have to request a payment plan from the IRS. They're not automatically going to enter you into this. And so the form that you're going to use to set up this non-disclosure agreement is going to be the 433D form that you can see on your screen. Now, like I said, for balances under 50,000, you can set those up by direct debit or by manual payment. Now, like I also said, is you always, I always recommend to set those up by direct debit to make sure you're not missing any payments or nothing happens there. Because when what happens with these is if you miss payments toward, for your monthly payment agreement, the IRS will default your agreement. What happens when they default the agreement is they will send your account back into the collections unit and they will begin collection action again. So you would be at risk of levies and garnishments again. Um, in order to avoid that, you wanna make sure that you're keeping up to date on all of your payments. You also, with these, once you have it set up, you want to, you have to make sure you're making those monthly payments, but then you also have to make sure that you're filing all of your future required returns on time and you're paying any balances, any new balances that you owe in full prior to the original filing deadline. So even if you file an extension for that, your tax return during the year, you still have to pay whatever amount that you owe that year prior
prior to the original deadline, which is usually in April. So in order to like, just to summarize that part of it is in order to avoid default, you have to make sure you're making your monthly payments on time. And then you also have to make sure you're filing all of your required returns and you're paying any balances in full prior to the um, original filing deadline. Now, another thing I wanna discuss with these streamlined non-disclosure agreements is tax liens. Now, when you owe balances to the IRS, the IRS will sometimes file a tax, a federal tax lien. Now, the way I usually will explain federal tax liens is that they are filed in the county where you either reside or you own property. Now, what will and they attach to your property. So what will happen is if you were to go and sell your home after you paid off the mortgage, the IRS would step in in next as the next person in line, the next creditor, and they would be entitled to the amount of the profit and the balance you owed. So that's how the federal tax liens work. Now with streamlined non-disclosure agreements, if you owe between, if the if federal tax liens have not been filed yet and you owe an amount between zero and $50,000, if you set up a streamlined non-disclosure agreement, that will avoid those federal tax liens being filed. If your balance is over 50,000, there will be a lien required to be filed. Now, if your balance, if federal tax liens have already been filed and you owe a balance between zero and 25,000, then you can go ahead and set up the agreement and you can um, get those removed. There's there's a type of non-disclosure agreement that you can set up and after three direct debit payments, then you can request that lien to be removed. So that's basically what you would do is you would get this 433D uh, form, you would fill this out and then you would mail it. The IRS, part of the instructions of this 433D, they will go line by line to exactly how you're going to complete this. They are also going to have mailing instructions, so they will give you the address of where to mail this form. Once you mail it, it will usually take uh, two to three months, usually, for the IRS to process that and begin that. Um, let's see. I think that's everything for the non-disclosure agreements. Those are the basics anyway. It's really, really important, though, that you read through the instructions of this because there are always going to be unique circumstances and things like that that are going to affect it. So next, if you cannot afford that non-disclosure agreement payment, what you're going to be looking at next are these partial pay payment agreements. Um, these are financial based, so you are going to be required to submit financial information to the IRS and they sometimes will require the evidence. Now, on the left side, you can see these two forms. The first form that you can see the 433D that we just talked about with the streamline payment agreement. That is just basically to give the IRS your direct debit information so that they can debit your account for the payment each month. Now, the other form you can see is a financial information statement. That is the 433A. So when you go, if you're trying to look for this form, you can go to the IRS website and you can type in form 433A or form 433D and that will take you to the correct form. Now, the financial statement, what that basically is going to ask you is your residency information, your identification information, your residency. It's going to ask you about all of your household income, your household expenses, your assets, and your liabilities. Now, like we talked about, what you're going to do to find out the monthly payment amount is you're going to take all of your monthly income for the household and you're going to subtract out the monthly necessary expenses, and that's going to be your payment. Now, important things about this. Because you're not paying the full amount of the balance prior to the expiration date of the balance, the IRS will require that liens are filed if you owe them more than $10,000. So if your balance is over $10,000, they will file a federal tax lien. If your balance is under $10,000, they will not file that tax lien. Now, in order to avoid default, of your partial pay agreement or your financial based agreement, you have to make sure that you're filing any required tax returns every year. You're making sure that you are paying any additional balances, any future balances 
prior to, again, the original filing deadline, which is usually in April. Same thing, even if you file an extension to file your tax return, that does not extend the time to pay only to file. So you have to make sure any future balances that you owe are paid before April. Um, you have to make sure that you're making your payments on time in the amount that they are. Um, and then you have to, um, depending on when they renew it, this is usually the IRS will require you to update your financial information generally every two to three years, uh, just to make sure that you still qualify for that same monthly payment. Your payment may increase or decrease, but that depends on your current financial situation at that time. So if you were to get another job and be paid much more, they may require a larger payment. Um, whereas the non-disclosure agreement, that, that payment's going to be the same for every month for the either the 72 or the 84 months. This payment is dependent on your financial situation. And so if your situation were to improve, your payment would increase if your situation doesn't improve. If maybe you are in a worse situation, they may require a lower payment when you update your financials. So the next agreement, so those are payment plans. That's one category. Now, if you can't afford to make a monthly payment plan, the IRS offers this other protective agreement. This one is called currently non-collectible status, CNC, or it's also known as hardship status. Now, what this is, is a protected agreement where when you're in it, you do not have to make payments toward your balances and the IRS cannot take collection action against you. So they cannot levy, they cannot garnish um, your wages. Now, what this is, is this is an, another financial based agreement, just like that partial pay agreement. You're going to have to provide all of your financial information to the IRS to show them that you cannot afford to make any payments to them. Um, now, currently non-collectible status, it does not remove the tax balance that you owe. What it does is the balance will stay there, but the IRS will not require payments. Um, penalties and interest will continue to accrue uh, until the balance comes to an expiration date. So generally, so the statute of limitations for balances on your IRS debt is going to be 10 years. That's the 10, it's collection statute of expir, expiration date. So the balances, they can possibly last longer if that if that is extended. However, generally you're going to see the balances on your account for 10 years. And that's what I'm talking about is if that, if you get past that 10 years, when that deadline hits, that whatever's not paid by that expiration date will be removed from your account. So Currently non-collectible status, like I said, interest and penalties will continue to accrue um, until that balance is either paid in full or it expires. Um, so for currently non-collectible status, to stay in the status in order to avoid default, you have to make sure, again, you're filing all of your returns on time and you do not owe future balances. If you owe future balances, you need to also make sure that you're paying them prior to that filing deadline each year. Again, same thing with the extension. An extension to file does not extend the time to pay. So you have to make sure that you're paying any future balances prior to April 15th, usually, of each year. Now, with liens for currently non-collectible status, the IRS, if your balance is over $10,000, the IRS will file tax liens. If it is under $10,000, usually the IRS will not file tax liens. Now, CNC is generally viewed as a temporary agreement, meaning the IRS is basically allowing you to be in this protected status where they're not requiring payments and they're not trying to collect from you. And that's to allow you time to try to improve your financial situation. And then if you can make payments, if you can afford to make payments in the future, then maybe you can enter into a payment agreement at that time. The IRS, like the partial payment, they usually will require you to update your financials every two to three years for currently non-collectible status, but as long as you continue to qualify. So if your situation doesn't improve, you can continue to qualify for this every time you update your financial information.
So in order to set up your currently non-collectible status, this is the same form that we used for the partial payment agreement, the 433A. This is the financial statement. So again, you're going to be putting in your identifying information. You're going to include your all of your household income, all of your household expenses, your assets, and your liabilities. Now, with this, again, you may have to, the IRS may require you to provide evidence, some documentation like bank statements or your lease or something like that. They may require you to provide that to them when you're requesting this hardship status. Um, generally, the way you're going to look to see if you qualify for this is if you take your monthly household income and you subtract your monthly expenses, again, those are necessary living expenses. It's not 100% of your expenses. It's going to be your necessary living expenses. And you'll find this out when you fill out this form. So if you take your monthly household income, subtract your monthly uh, necessary expenses, if that is below zero, that means that you will qualify for this currently non-collectible status, generally, as long as you don't have a whole bunch of secondary assets or, or a lot of equity in your assets. That is the general qualification for it. Now, um, this is, again, just like the payment agreements, this is something that you have to actively request from the IRS. They are not automatically going to put you into currently non-collectible status based on the income that is reported to them. So you want to make sure that when that you're filling out this 433A correctly. And again, you're looking at the instructions to go line by line. That will help you complete this form. And then there's going to be a mailing address on there so that you can mail this in and make this request. It is going to take the IRS some time to process this once they receive the form. Um, I would generally say, again, two to three months. It could be longer, depending on delays. It would generally take about that amount of time then they would go ahead and put your account into currently non-collectible status if you qualified. And then they, after they did that, they would send you a letter just letting you know that you qualified. They placed your account into currently non-collectible status. And then it would give you many more instructions to tell you basically kind of what we went over plus some additional information. So how not how to avoid defaulting in the future. So We've talked about installment payment agreements and we've talked about currently non-collectible status. The next thing we want to talk about, this is the third alternative protective agreement, is the offer and compromise. So an offer and compromise is a settlement agreement in which the IRS accepts a lower amount than what you owe them. So for an example, if you were to owe the IRS $50,000, you could potentially, depending depending on the qualification, you could potentially offer them $10 and they may accept that in place of the $50,000 that you owe. So it's a little bit more complicated. It's not quite that simple, but that is the general idea of it. So what happens with an offer and compromise, there is a calculation that you can do to find out how much you need to offer to the IRS for this amount. Uh, for for this the settlement amount. Now, to see if you qualify for this, you can go to the IRS website and they have a pre-qualifier calculation. So you can go to the pre-qualifier. It's called the, the offer and compromise pre-qualifier. And you can put your information and that will tell you if you qualify for an offer and compromise or not. So that's a really good first step before submitting an offer and compromise, just to see um, the IRS's perspective on whether you're going to qualify. Now, once an offer, so basically you're going to submit an offer and compromise. You, you're going to make this offer to the IRS. From that point, when you submit this, this is going to be a much longer waiting period to determine if you if uh, you are going, your account is going to be approved for this. So generally, there's a six to nine month month waiting period, and that can be just to get an agent assigned to this, um, but it can include the review. It just depends on the, on the individual circumstances. But it could go from six months. It could sometimes they will, it will take over a year to get this resolved. So this is going to be a much longer waiting time. Um, and so, but during that waiting time, the collection action is held. So the IRS is not going to try to levy or garnish you while they're reviewing your offer and compromise. 
What they do during the offer and compromise is they will review all of your financial information. And with an offer and compromise, there are evidentiary requirements. So it's not if they if the IRS just requests them. You initially have to send in bank statements, credit reports. Um, you have to have documentation for all of your expenses. There's lots of documentation for this. And once you send it in, once the IRS assigns an agent to review it, they may reach out to you to request additional um, documentation or explanations for things that are on your financial statement. Now, once they go through the review, if they accept the offer, what will happen is they will send you a letter telling you that they accepted the offer. They will then, it doesn't immediately remove the rest of the balance. You'll make your payment of whatever your offer was, depending on what kind of offer and compromise you submitted. There's two different kinds. There is a lump sum payment, which has to be paid within five months after acceptance. And then there is a periodic payment, which is 20, you have 24 months to make those payments starting from when you submit that, um, that application. So if the IRS does accept your offer and compromise, what they will do then is you will make your payments they will monitor your account for five years just to make sure that you're continuing to file all required returns and that you are not continuing to owe balances to the IRS. Um, if you can get through the five years, making sure that you're not continuing to owe and you're filing your returns on time, the IRS, after that five years, they will remove the rest of the balance and you will not be liable for that anymore. Um, if they do deny it, what will happen is they will send you a letter with the denial of the offer and compromise, and then any payments that you already be you already made will be applied to the total balance, and then you would still be liable for that full amount, and then you would go back into the collections unit and be at risk of collection action. So then what you would have to do is you would have to try and set up another type of alternative agreement if you still couldn't afford to pay that balance in full. So in order to apply for the offer and compromise, you're gonna be looking at this form 656 booklet. This is the offer and compromise. It's kind of long and it has lots and lots of information. One of the forms in it is going to be the same form that we've talked about with these financial based agreements is that 433A form. You have to disclose all of your financial information. So that form is going to be in that booklet. You're also going to have another form that basically it will help you do the offer calculation. What the offer calculation consists of is your household income minus your household expenses. You're going to take that amount and then you're going to add you're going to um, multiply it by either 12 or 24, depending on what type of offer agreement you're submitting. And you'll see this in the instructions. And then you're going to add your net expense, your net assets, I'm sorry, your net assets to that amount. And that is the offer amount that the IRS is looking for. Now, that is not always going to be a, just a streamlined straight calculation for the correct offer amount. That is the general guideline. What they're also looking for is future earning potential. Do you have the potential to improve your situ your financial situation and make more payments in the future prior to the expiration of that date? They're also looking at other types of hardships and things like that. So even if you have a lot of equity and you're, you only say you only have one home and you have a lot of equity in it, but there's no way that you could afford to take out like a loan against your house or something like that, that might you may be able to explain that to the IRS with your application of your offer and compromise and they may agree with you that you're not going to be able to make higher payments because you can't access that equity so there's a lot of reasons that you can or explanations you can give to the IRS for your situation of why your offer amount is lower than that straight calculation but in this offer and compromise booklet, there is going to be a form that will help you make that calculation of the amount of the offer. And then what will happen is, depending, like I said, on the type of offer you send in, you're either going to be making, you're going to send in an initial payment with the application. And then upon acceptance, you would pay the remaining balance in five or fewer payments, monthly payments. And then the other type of offer is you're going to submit your first monthly payment when you submit your application and you're going to continue to make monthly payments for 24 months um if you are a low income taxpayer there is a box on there that you can check and the irs will not require you to make any payments until that 
um, until they accept the offer. So make sure you're checking that if you do qualify for that. Um, so th that's the offer and compromise. Now, this does toll the statute of limitations. And so if your expiration date is coming up, just make sure that, that you take that into consideration. That does do that. Um, this is also, like I said, I want to stress, you have that five-year monitoring period. So you have to make sure that you are compliant. You're filing all your required returns and you're making sure that you pay any future balances prior to the original filing date um, each year. So in order to determine which agreement that is best for you, you're basically going to, if you, you're going to look at them in order. If you qualify for a currently non-collectible status um, or a heart, or an offer and compromise, you're going to go with those. If you don't qualify for those, then you would go ahead and look at these payment agreements. Now, we talked, like I said, about setting up these agreements. You're going to follow the instructions in the form. Um, make sure that you are finding your correct address. They are based on state, so you want to make sure that you're finding the correct um, address for that. Make sure you include any payment, you include any required documentation for that. Um, it's, it's really, really important. You want to make sure you're as detailed as possible in it and that you're providing everything that is required. Once you send that in, the IRS will respond that they received it via USPS. So that's all I have for today. Does anybody have any questions? I do not see any questions at the moment. Um, is there anything else that you missed that you kind of encourage them to reach out to you to get more details on? Yes. And I think, do we have um, a, slide, a contact information slide? I think that's next. Um, so yes. So this is a lot of information. It's very, it can be very complicated, very confusing. There's a lot of documentation required. Um, so if you need help, we are here to help you. Like I said, we're the low income tax clinic here at Florida Rural Legal Services. We have tax attorneys and paralegals and we offer free con tax controversy representation to low income taxpayers and taxpayers who speak English as a second language. Um, we are so happy to help. Uh, we are very, very experienced. We know how to find out all of um, all of the issues we are, are very understanding we and we really care we really really want to help you so please please reach out to us if we can help you um, at all so this is our contact information we have our phone number on here and chanel neath is the litc paralegal so please feel free to reach out and give her a call if you're interested I'm happy to kind of set up an appointment and just talk to you about your issues on the phone. And then if we just, if you want to move forward on your own, you can do that. But if you'd like our help, I'm, I'm very, very happy to help as well. And one last question. Some people may think, hey, let me reach out to Frails to help me file my taxes. I just want to add a little nugget there before we go. That's a, that's a, a I'm glad you said that. So yes. The LITC program, we offer free tax controversy uh, representation. We do not only file returns. We can do that if it's part of the controversy, but we don't do just that. So if you just need to file your returns, there's another great program called the VITA program. You can reach out to them for that. So, um, but we, so we don't just prepare tax returns unless it is related to a controversy issue. All right, thank you. We can wrap it up and close it up. All right, great. Thank you so much.